Hi, everyone, and welcome to our presentation today, How to Get the Most Out of Technical Training with Martha Hollowell. Martha, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kareen. Good afternoon, and welcome to everyone. I'm glad you all came online today to talk about technical training and how to get the most of it. I am Martha Hollowell, as she said. I'm a senior instructional designer with Ascent. Uh, I've been working with Autodesk products since the early 1990s. As a matter of fact, I started on AutoCAD 2.5. So that is a very old version of AutoCAD. Um, so I've been around for a while. I have also worked in the architectural field. I've done technical training on AutoCAD and other things, as well as Microsoft Back Office and things like that. And now I concentrate on writing about Revit architecture, Revit MEP, and Revit structure. So why am I talking about training today? Well, I've been a trainee, I've been a trainer, and now I'm a training designer. And I want people to be able to use the material I create to do their work back at the office. I also realize that as good as the material may be, it's not up to me to encourage the actual learning. That's up to you, especially those who are managing people who are in need of training. So that's a little bit about me, and what I'd like to do is ask a little bit about you. So we have a poll here that we're going to bring up. Um, these are some job titles. They are general, so pick the one that's closest to who you are. If you can tell me who, what is the closest of these. And we'll just take a few seconds here as we take a look at that. Another four seconds till it closes. Okay. Okay, the poll's closed, and let's see how it comes up. Just give me a few seconds, Martha. Okay, it's sure. Thing on the back end. Polling is a little bit complex, so uh, everyone, I thank you for your patience. And. These job titles, by the way, are ones that I picked up. I did this particular presentation at Autodesk University this year. There we go. So um, the main people, main number of people at Autodesk were all some kind of managers. So I see, you know, we've got managers, especially CAD BIM manager, uh, very similar to what we had, engineers, architects. No upper management today, um, but we do have IT trainers and users. So welcome. This is good to know. Uh, I have another question for you, and this one is what software do you use? So uh, when I say AutoCAD design, I mean specifically AutoCAD, um, Revit building design, that's that group, um, factory design, infrastructure, civil 3D, plant design, um, product design is uh, Inventor. So if you could just take a minute and tell me what all of these are. We didn't have other, sorry about that. This, this particular talk is actually very useful beyond just Autodesk products. So uh, it could be that some people are others. So our poll has closed, and we will see what's available. And once again, when uh, we did it out at Autodesk, large majority were AutoCAD, uh, Revit, and uh, Inventor users. That just happened to be who was in my particular class with a few people um, otherwise. So here we have um, AutoCAD design, building design, factory design. Okay, we've got a little bit of everybody. So that's pretty cool. Good. Okay, well, Let's talk about what we're going to do today. So we are going to, by the end of this class, we're going to be able to differentiate between an issue that can be solved by technical training and one that cannot. We're going to identify people that benefit the most from various types of technical training. We're going to analyze learning styles and principles. And we are going to establish ways to help people retain knowledge from a training class. And that, of course, is probably the most important part of what we want to be able to do. Now, all through this, I have a few questions that I'm going to ask you. You'll see the little cue and then a question coming up. And uh, this is going to be able to let you take what you're learning in this webcast back to your job right away and do some work on it. 
In this case, because we're a webcast, I'm not going to be leaving much time for any of this. So uh, instead, I'm going to let you see those questions. And I will definitely have these questions coming out to you later on. But if you have time or right now, if you have a piece of paper and a pen, uh, write down your thoughts as I bring up these questions. The first question I want to know is, what technical training are you thinking of implementing right now? Probably if you came on this, you have a specific one that you are thinking of, and we would like to know, or in your case, you need to decide which one is it. So am I moving from AutoCAD into a 3D modeling program? I'm going to need to do that kind of it. You know, if I'm, I've got people who are uh, users right now, but they aren't using it well, you know, that's the kind of technical training that is needed. So think about exactly what technical training you're thinking of implementing right now, and then keep that in mind as we go through the entire class. 100 billion dollars. That is a lot of money. And that's how much is spent on training each year, probably over that now. Um, the State of the Industry report uh, by the Association for Talent Development says much of this money is wasted because what is learned is not applied on the job. And you don't want that happening in your company. So let's look at some solutions. We're going to be bringing our friend Hamlet, as played by Sir Lawrence Olivier here, to answer to um, propose some questions for us periodically. And the first is to train or not to train. That is the question. Mm -hmm. The big thing here is not every technical issue can be solved by training. And as a teacher and loving teaching, I always wanted to think that could solve everything, but it really can't. So what you really need to do is identify the real issues. So I looked at this picture and I thought, oh my gosh, it's the guy in the tie. And then I realized, oh no, everyone, or all the men in this particular picture <laughs> have on ties. So hopefully it's not. That's not the real issue. But what if the guy in the tie is showing up to work late? Your projects aren't getting done. You're, um, you're behind on your schedule. Uh, every, others are frustrated because they're not getting what they need. Technical training probably won't help in this issue because it's not the real issue. So let's look at some real issues that it might be beyond training. Uh, personnel issues, such as that absenteeism, people not working together, right? Um, what, whatever um, issues, people, things that are going on in people's lives that are keeping them from being as productive as they could. Another real issue is unclear performance expectations and feedback. And it is very difficult if you don't know what you're supposed to do to be excited about going to training and learning anything because you aren't sure about what am I supposed to use, how am I supposed to do this. Um, inadequate rewards is another situation, and those rewards might be tangible. Um, as well as encouragement. And um, I did get my uh, project manager sent me a little email, you know, do great on your web webcast. So that's a good thing. I was getting some good rewards there. Uh, another thing is it could be a bad match between the employee and the job, and no technical training is going to ever fix that. It really, you need to make sure that the employee and the job are working together. Lack of job security is another big, big issue. Um, a, some people have been sent to training and then they're laid off. And so somebody else comes on, it's time to train them. They're going, oh no, I'm going to be laid off. So that is a, a real issue, a real concern. And another big one is there's no plan for new software implementation. And one example I'm kind of give along throughout the class is that you're planning on moving from a basic 2D design program into a 3D modeling one. And if you just send people out for training, they're not going to be able to really do it if you have no plan for the way it will be implemented. You need a rollout. And training can be part of that implementation, but it's not the whole solution. Of course, there are more. Um, I'm not going to, you can think of them yourself, some real issues that are in your particular company. 
But what you really need to do is go for the root of the problem. Rob Rosner, who wrote the article, Training is the Answer, But What is the Question?, says, don't train for the sake of training. Training sessions are like meetings. Hold them only when you really need them. Now, that would be nice if that really happened, too. So let's look at some of the things that you need to do uh, if you've decided, yes, training is the answer, or you're even in the process of deciding, is training the answer? The next thing you need to do is identify the people in involved. Commonly called stakeholders, these people from all levels of the com company are the ones whose work is impacted by the situation you've identified. They um, include upper level administrators because these are the people who can say, yes, the training is going to happen, we have the money for it, um, all sorts of information that's happening at that level. Um, managers, so the direct managers, are they going to support the people who are being trained or did it just come down from above and they're, oh, I'm losing my people for a week? A uh, very different aspect than if they are involved and excited about it. The employees, do they understand the need for training? Why are they even bothered being sent to training? Employees' peers, how are they going to work together with or without training? Uh, this is some of that interaction situation that you need to identify who that is. And finally, customers. Will training ultimately benefit the customer? In some cases, you might have the customer requesting or requiring that you use certain software or use a part of the software you haven't used before, um, and they're definitely going to be impacted by your training. Lori Simono, a training director for a large company, said, the extra effort you invest up front makes the difference between solving a real problem or just delivering a training program. And what you want to be able to do is solve that real problem that probably has a training component. So my next question is this. Who are the stakeholders in your company? And are they on board with the training you thought about earlier? And like I said, I'm not going to leave this um, up and discuss it right now, but you can make some quick notes um, and also come back to this one. Who are the stakeholders in your company, and are they on board with training? And if you are right away think of somebody who's not on board, let's think of some solutions to help get them on board. Well, Hamlet is back now to help us put some method into the madness of training. Technical training is the solution, you decide. But the next question is who and what type of training. This is especially important if you're implementing something new and life-changing. Just ask anyone who's moved from 2D drafting to 3D modeling. And this is thanks to Burke Hogan Mills, who did this office design. Oops, okay. So the um, next thing we need to do is think about choosing the right people. And you want training to stick, and you want that to be effective. Who is actually a large part of the component? You want to choose people who like to learn and are interested in the product. Um, if you choose somebody who really doesn't care and send them out for training first thing, they may not care when they come back. So a good person to send is someone who likes to learn. Uh, it, then if they are the people that like to learn, they're interested, they can champion the product. And so having somebody, maybe you send out a few people as a test run to get training if you have a large group of people to train, and uh, they come back and they're excited about it and they will be able to champion the product. So it's a good people to be able to do that. Of course, you want to choose people who are not using the software effectively. Um, and this can be anyone from you know, somebody brand new to someone who's been using it for years. Uh, you want to take a close look at how users are actually developing the projects. Are they um, effective doing them? Would training help them in this area? And that could either be in-house training or um, out uh, training, software training. One thing I'd like to say is fundamentals doesn't hurt. 
anyone. A lot of people go, what? I've used AutoCAD or 3D, Civil 3D for years. Why do I have to go to fundamentals training? But a lot of times you have bad habits that you have um, gotten together, and then there's also a lot of more effective workflow that's out there. And so you want to be able to know what's really working, and sometimes going back to a fundamentals class is actually the best thing to do, especially if you're jumping several um, revisions of, a, of the software. Another group is they were going to put training to immediate use. You may have heard the term just-in-time training, and this is a very accurate um, thing to do because if you send someone to training, you think, oh, well, you know, next year we're going to you know, load the software, let's get them now, we're kind of slow. That's really not a very useful time to send someone to training. But if you are going to implement the, uh, using the software right away when they get back from training or after they've had the training, um, then you have the, a regular setup and on-the-job assignment that will put the training to much better use. And of course, some people are better off not being trained, and you probably know who they are, so I won't even say anything more about that. But it is one of the things about the job versus the person, um, and you might need to check on that. So basically, when you choose people, you want people to come into training ready to be learners. Bob Pike of Creative Training Techniques says, most people come to training with one of four mindsets. As a learner, good thing. As a networker, they're just trying to meet other people. As a vacationer, okay, I just have a few days off. Or as a prisoner, I am being forced into this training. And needless to say, while I was at Las Vegas, I think vacationer came up quite heavy <laughs> in some of the classes. Um, but it is, kind of, it is very important. You do want to have um, some people learning. And people who are interested in something are much more able to learn and apply it either through a class or on their own. So people are critical to the equation. But it's also important to choose the right type of training for the situation. Um, you might want to be asking some questions like, how much time is available for training? What level of training is needed? Uh, who should do the training? Do we want it in-house or off-site? Of course, you need to ask, how much money do we have for this training? And it might depend on what it is you need to use various kinds of training. One of those first um, ways of training is to use what's called a job aid. Um, a job aid can be anything like this quick access reference card. Um, in this particular case, this was for some people who were doing a lot of curtain walls and then creating uh, construction documents and annotating them. So all the information they need is right here on this little card to get the, um, the basic things that they need to do in their job. Um, now, of course, you, I wouldn't want to give this to somebody if they hadn't already had training. So this is really a better piece of follow-up training, um, you know, so they have it quick and access. But, it, but job aids can be very useful. There's other kinds of job aids. Um, this particular one is by David Allen from Getting Things Done. And if you haven't seen it, it's one of my favorite uh, methods of trying to be productive. Um, but it gives you a good example of a decision tree. So in your job, if you have some things that need to happen a certain way, if you go one way or another, this uh, decision tree can be a very useful um, way of working. And that's just an example. Any kind of repetitive decision making. Um, check checklists are another job aid. Um, this one's just a quick one out of Word that I grabbed. Um, but I use check checklists a lot in my projects um, and just I know these are the same things that are needed over and over. So once again, any kind of series of steps that you might need or a process that's going um, on constantly, a similar process, another good job aid. Another way of training is on-the-job training. Uh, it's very people-oriented. You have direct interaction. Um, it's also a very good way to teach someone to perform tasks. Uh, this can include like shadowing a coworker or coaching or mentoring. It can even be as far as a formal apprenticeship where certain things are dealt with periodically. 
Um, they, th the benefits of this include it's v very good for individuals because you're getting exactly what's needed, so it's very helpful in that way. Um, it's also useful for your own ways of working. Uh, for example, if you go out to a software class, they are not necessarily teaching your methods from your office. So um, some of the on-the-job training uh, could be beneficial there. Um, and if it's formalized, you know everything's getting covered that you want. So that's another aspect of on-the-job training. Self-paced learning is probably the most used methods these days. Um, it's great for quick answers. Uh, it's it's cheaper in most most cases. Uh, if you have lack of time, it's you can just stick it in here and there. So it can be very very useful um, in those areas. Some methods include training guides and books. If you can see on the uh, in the slide over there on her left, <laughs> she has a book open as she's checking through things. Um, you might have an e-learning site that is available with the content you need. YouTube videos, um, as Karine says, we'll be posting this on our YouTube channel. So a lot of things are out there. Um, search engines, good old Google, very helpful to find things that you might need. Um, and then various forums and blogs. And I do, you know, when I have a question, I'm working along with something. Now, what would people do here? Um, I do. I have a few blogs that I uh, typically check out, and um, and also just do the search engines can be very helpful. Of course, the b benefits of this, it's not time or content specific. It's what and when you need it. It's always available, and m most frequently it's cheaper. So do be aware, there can be some expensive stuff out there. Um, one example of uh, some self-paced learning that I did recently was uh, for a class for being an Autodesk certified instructor. And the preliminary ma um, material for the class was online. So we had to do an e-learning component and finish it, and there were tests in it, and you, they knew whether or not you finished it. And you had to do that before you actually uh, attended the in-person class, which, of course, leads us to instructor-led training. Uh, this is very useful for complex content, uh, such as most of the Autodesk software. It gives you a time, a focused time, to really learn a lot of information. It gives you some benefits. You get immediate feedback from the instructor. So if you're in a classroom like this or even in your office in a personal classroom, uh, you have access to experts. So you can ask questions that you, know, you may come up with. There's group interaction, which again can be a very helpful way of working. And learning, uh, groups to, to learn are, are very helpful. And it can be like this in a classroom, in-house or off-site, might be conferences. You, know, you might be doing a small group right there in your office. Instructor-led training can also be uh, virtual. So lots of virtual classes and web conferences, webcasts like you are on right now. Um, I don't have that cool of a little microphone, but hey. <laughs> um, we do have the webcasts that you can see. You might have e-learning with instructor monitor monitoring. Some of that is what they call synchronous, which is at the same time with the students. So you might have a webinar, and the instructor is actually leading it at a specific time. And then there's also what they call asynchronous um, um, e-learning, which is everyone comes on whenever they want to, but there's a forum, there's a chat, there's an instructor who interacts with them. So you can have some types of methods like that, too. Of course, if you're going to be doing an in-house training, and especially I saw a number of people on the list that were trainers, um, if they are in-house, you can use all of the types of training that I just mentioned. You want to be on the lookout for documentation that's already available so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, provide job aids, such as a quick access card for either work you do or your personal company CAD and BIM standards. Um, things like that can be very helpful in a job aid. Uh, you can work one-on-one -on -one with people when they're tackling a specific issue, such as the first time they attempt to do a complex part of a project. Uh, you can provide training guides or e-learning sites that are spe 
specifically selected that they can use when they have time. So you provide that um, option. Um, you can also select a list of good websites. Uh, like I say, when you just Google, you might come into cat videos or something like that. And really what you want your people to do is go to the right websites. So if you have ones that specifically match your information, it would be nice to send that out to everybody. Here's a list of good websites. And of course you can do lunch and learn programs, things like that, to get groups of people up to speed. So here's your next question. Who needs training? You've talked about what kind of training. You've thought about the various uh, people in your company that are impacted by this. Um, so now the question is, who needs the training and what type of training would be best? So maybe jot down a couple of notes there quickly. And um, then, of course, I, like I said, I will be able to get all these questions back to you at a later point. Well, Hamlet's back, and he is reminding us, to thine own self be true. And we all learn in different ways, and it helps if you know thine own self. Uh, no matter where you are or who you are in the learning process, you might be the manager, the trainee, the instructor, uh, it helps to understand how adults learn. So let's take a quick look first at some different types of learning styles. A lot, has been of, a lot has been written about learning styles, and these apply to people of all ages. And there are three primary ways that we're going to talk about here that people learn. Some people learn best when they see it. These are the visual learners. They prefer pictures and diagrams and videos. Uh, you can see that I'm pretty much a visual learner because I like to make all my slides. Um, auditory learners hear like to hear it. They learn best when they hear it. And this is verbal instruction. And it's also repeating it back. So they're hearing themselves say it. So they are actually hearing it. Then you, some people learn best when they do it. The kinesthetic learners prefer hands-on tasks. And so you might, um, you need to actually do something and then you learn it better. So we do have another poll, I do believe. Is that right, Kareen? Yes, here it is. What is your primary learning style? So just you only pick one. What's your primary learning style, if you know it? And a lot of people will have blends, too. So um, we'll talk about that in a minute. We'll be closing in five seconds, the poll. Okay, I just need a few minutes for it to uh, tabulate the information for you, Martha. Okay, thank you. So here we come. We're just doing visual. And now I'll do a little bit of auditory. And Karine is doing a lot of kinesthetic. <laughs> <laughs> Hitting away, how do I get to these? So yes, uh, no, no big surprise here. Majority of the people on this call are kinesthetic learners. Um, they really learn it best when they do it. And even in my um, AU class, and there were, I don't remember now, how it's almost 100 or so people there, one person was an auditory learner. So, <laughs> so the fact that there's only there's zero on this particular is not a big surprise. Now, everyone has a different blend of learning styles. So, you know, yes, visual might be your main or kinesthetic might be your main, um, but you use auditory as, as well. So you need to make sure that you are adapting training to meet the needs of the people involved. So really the best training uh, includes a mix. Well, the learning styles that we just talked about are active throughout your entire life. But when you become an adult, there are new twists to the way you learn. Many people have written about these principles, adult learning principles, and, but it all boils down to a cooperative learning environment. And we're going to also do a few more polls here, and we're going to see if you can tell what some of these principles are yourself. So I'm going to be doing a series of true and false questions, and so we will be bringing up the questions and the polls. So the first question, or first statement, actually, not question, 
Um, adults have shorter attention spans than younger learners. Is this true or false? And there's our poll. Adults have shorter attention spans than younger learners. Five seconds left. Oh, that's too much. We've lost train of thought. Our short attention spans. <laughs> <laughs> it's just tabulating the results, no, Martha. You'll see it in a few seconds. Okay. Okay, nobody hang up. We're waiting. We're going to have longer attention spans. Yes. We're almost Maybe waiting. not. <laughs> I'll go ahead and, and say what's what. Oh, no, here it comes. Oh, hey, about half and half. Um, the research shows that this is true. And what we're talking about here is not being focused on just anything, because a lot, and that's probably what a lot of people are thinking when they said false, um, but on learning tasks, because you're so focused on doing your other work. So it's not saying that adults are not focused, <laughs> but just not as much on um, the, uh, oh, sorry, within learning. Um, one of the principles here that we are talking about is you want to respect the people who are learning. Uh, and that's one of the ways you can do that is really to help them stay focused. Next question or a statement. Most adults prefer to learn about theories and concepts rather than direct application to specific tasks. So here's our poll, true or false. Most adults prefer to learn about theories and concepts rather than about direct application to specific tasks. Another few seconds, it'll close. Okay, that's closed. Let's see what comes up. I think part of this is we have a, a lot of people on, mm -hmm. and so it's taking a little submit. bit. Yeah, then you just submit the response. Oh, the yes, yes, so make sure you submit, otherwise um, it takes even longer to come through. So sorry about that. I was supposed to mention it earlier. There we go. So most, um, most adults are right. Um, and very, very interesting. This is false. 17% of you said it's true. 20% of people out there prefer learning about theories and concepts. Isn't that interesting? So 80% of adults prefer straightforward how-to instruction over theory. And we actually have just about that group of people here actually on our in our class. So majority of people, so the true is actually true for those 20% who do like theories. Um, the principle that we're talking about here is relevance. You want to focus on real life situations and tasks. So in uh, for adult learners, focus on real life situations and tasks. Adults need more time to perform learning activities. So remember this one now is learning activities. And is this true or false? Adults need more time to perform learning activities. OK, another few seconds. Do make sure you submit, please. OK, doke. Okay. Submitting. Computers need more time to perform learning activities, too. Everyone gets to this point. It's like, what? It's more than a second? Why am I getting frustrated? <laughs> there we go. And majority of y'all are accurate. It is true. So some of you guys out there, are, and girls out there, um, are actually learning faster. But most learners, as they age, slow down. So there's even, if you think your um, writing is bad as your doctors, it might be. You've probably gotten to it over time. The pr uh, principle that we're talking about here, though, is, again, is respect. So if you are one of the trainers, and I heard a number of you out there, um, give people the time needed to learn. Um, this is also good for the managers so that you realize that, you know, hey, this person is not learning fast enough. Well, give them the time to learn and make sure that you're getting the right learning styles, and a lot will happen. And it's also for yourself. Give yourself the time you need. 
adults are more sensitive to learning failure than students. Here's our polling. Adults are more sensitive to learning failure than students. Is this true or false? Another few seconds to answer. Okay. And if you don't don't forget to hit submit. Almost there. Almost there. We're Just coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and hit it. It's true. <laughs> so once that comes up, um, then we'll, we'll see what everyone thinks. Um, a, uh, no, I am not seeing it yet, the polling, the answer. Ah, there we go. So most people did think it was true. Uh, you probably have worked with other people in your office. Um, adults are prone to taking errors personally. Uh, in fact, a lot of adults can view training situations where, as a place they've got to prove themselves. They've got a, my professional reputation and personal image are on the line. And so you want to, once again, respect the people as they are learning and partner with the participants and making sure that they are um, comfortable in the level and uh, amount that they are learning. Here's an interesting statement. Adults who have been recently promoted are not as receptive to training as other professionals. So here's our poll, and it says adults who've been recently promoted are not as receptive to training as other professionals. Okay, poll should be closed. Okay, poll is closed, and we'll come up with the information in a bit. And I'm actually going to wait for this one because I am very interested to see what people think. This one, you know. Uh, the, all the studies and everything show um, the answer to this question. Uh, it's kind of surprising. Yep, there we go. Almost half and half. <laughs> and um, the answer to this is actually false. Um, studies show that work-related adult training is most effective when it takes place within two or three weeks of a promotion or other change in position. So that is actually a good time to do training as long as, of course, it is a beneficial one. Uh, for the, the principle we're talking about here is actually benefit. Adult learners like to have a benefit. So you want to show participants what they are getting out of attending training. And in this case, someone who's recently promoted or change in position, if they're sent to training that matches and benefits them, then they're um, much more available, much more able to actually um, pass it on when they get to the office. All right, one more, I think. Um, it's a good idea to relate the material, material you're presenting to an adult's past experience in high school or college. So it's a good idea to relate the material you're presenting to an adult's past experience in high school or college. Another few seconds to answer this. Oh. And please hit submit. There we go. All right, the poll is closed. This is not a test, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's just insight. Um, I would not have uh, answered all of these the same way I did after I looked at some of these studies, <laughs> which uh, showed these uh, particular things. All right, here it comes. Okay, about half and half again. The answer is false. So for all of those who said it was true, you had a great experience in high school or college, or you're fairly recently out of it, <laughs> and that is your main experience. But it is false. You should av avoid associating your training programs with formal education. Uh, many people do have bad memories and negative attitudes, uh, and so it's just not a good one. But the opposite of this is actually a principle. And that is the part about experience. You want to let the um, participants contribute to training with their real world experience. So it's not so much their past experience in high school or college that's a good one to relate to, but most importantly, what are they doing right now? And as you um, 
pull that out of them if you're the trainer or as you provide it, you actually are learning more and learning better um, by expressing your experience. So we looked at several adult learning um, principles. One is respect. Uh, I said that several times because it is very important. Benefit, you want to make sure the training benefits the people. Relevance, it needs to be relevant to their real world and what's needed. Um, it needs to ba be based on their experiences, so they want to be able to add uh, things to it. And two others include responsibility. Adults will take responsibility if they know why. So, you know, adults are responsible. They can do their own thing as long as they are feeling like there is a benefit and re relevant, re ah, <laughs> relevance to what they're doing. And another one is motivation. Um, adults really can be motivated to learn on their own, and the important part of what you need to do is get that motivation working. Now, I'm going to go through this next slide pretty quick. Um, just And like I said, I will make sure that this, these questions get out to you. Um, this one says, select one of the adult learning principles and reflect on how that impacts your training needs. So um, just think about this list. How does that impact what it is you're going to do, whether you are assigning people to training or whether you're going to be a trainer or whether you're going to be the person that's actually going to training. Sorry about being quick there, but we do need to keep going. Hamlet's back now to tell us to, I beseech you, remember. This is a section that many um, have been waiting for. It's how to retain the learning that happens in a technical training class, or any class for that matter. The solution doesn't start or stop in a classroom. So first we want to look at how to transfer the training. When you transfer training, you make sure what happened in the classroom or individual experience in learning, so whatever they've, that's happened then, gets back to the office and is applied. Let me first of all give you a little bit of theory. Mary Broad and John Newstrom wrote a book called Transfer of Training. It's a very powerful book with a lot of good information in it, a lot of good examples as well. And they describe transfer of training is the effective and continuing application by trainees to their jobs of the knowledge and skills gained in training. So basically, if you know that the people are applying what they've learned back at the office, then the transfer of training has happened. As part of their research, they created this grid, and then they asked hundreds of people for information. They identified three major players in the training process. The manager, which is not just the direct manager, but kind of all of management uh, in this case. Remember how we looked at the stakeholders, so the upper management as well as the direct manager. Um, what role do they, or how important are they in the process? Um, the trainer, how important is the trainer in the process? And how important is the trainee? Oh, and by the way, the trainer is really the choice of content, the training materials, and the actual trainer. Um, and then the trainee, you know, how important is the trainee? And then they looked at three different time periods before the training happens, during the training happens, and after the training happens. So I'm going to ask you what you think. Another poll is coming up. Who has the most impact to ensure that training is transferred to the job? And I'm asking for three different times. Who's the most important or most impactful for before? Who's the most impactful during? And who's the most impactful after? And we are giving a little bit more time for this particular poll since you have three questions to answer. So who makes the most impact? to making sure that the training is actually going to happen. OK, so our poll is closed. And let's see what people said. It'll just take us another few seconds here, Martha. OK. okay. Answering, so so the, the importance here, Cheryl, just, um, is the, the training getting transferred to the job. 
and you know everybody's going to have some part and all of it so it's just like who is the most important at each of these places okay so um and if you'll leave this poll up please kareen sure. um so before uh, most people did think it was the manager so before training uh, their studies did show that the manager was the most important uh, before training and during training, no big surprise there, yes, the trainer is the most important during. And the last one, the trainer, trainee, is what everyone thinks, but guess what? That's not true. To make sure that, the, and the writers of the study were surprised too, by the way, um, the person with the most impact to ensure that training is transferred to the job is the manager. And as we'll see, the manager is the one who helps us overcome barriers to learning, barriers to applying what's learned on the job. So while the trainee is important, and there's no question, uh, you know, during it you need to be uh, active and everything, um, we will take a look at a, a lot of ways that specifically the manager can help afterwards. Now, uh, there are also a few ways the writers of transfer of training recommended um, that people can do help during the various ones. So this is again, it's from transfer of training. So for the manager before the training is involve the trainees in program planning. And how many times have you just been told that go on to this training? Um, but instead, a good manager or the, in the system in here will get them involved in making sure that they're getting the right kind of training that's needed. The manager is very important during to prevent interruptions. Uh, so you've got the things in place, and we'll talk in a minute about some barriers and how the manager can prevent interruptions. Um, afterward, why, ah, sorry, afterward, they can publicize, publicize successes. Um, so that's, again, a very positive thing. And I'm going to talk about, though, a number of more um, practical things in a minute the manager can do as well. Uh, the trainer, of course, beforehand uh, can involve the managers and trainees. This can um, be, it's easier, of course, on an in-house one, but, you know, finding out what's really needed. Are you really getting the right um, training uh, happening? And the trainer can, or whoever's coordinating the training can be uh, the important one for that. During training, they um, need to answer the what's in it for me question. So that's really, again, the uh, adult learning principles we talked about, you know, make sure it's a benefit, make sure that it's using their experience, uh, and all of the others as well. Afterwards, they may conduct evaluation surveys and provide feedback, um, but after the training, the trainer is probably the least important of um, all of them when you get back, unless, of course, you're in-house. <laughs> then you've got a whole other round of things to take care of. Uh, the trainee uh, is, if you are asked to participate in advanced activities, it's very, very helpful uh, to do that. Then you're more likely to get the right training. Of course, during, we're you know, participating actively, just like we have asked for you with the, the polling, and I appreciate that, by the way, um, everybody uh, uh, chiming in on the polling, very helpful. Um, and then afterwards, uh, you're reviewing the training content and the learned skills and hopefully applying it as well. Now, here are a few more practical things to remember and apply. And the first is to demolish barriers to learning. Now, cell phones can be a huge barrier. See the guy in the back there talking? I don't know, does he really have a cell phone in his hand? He looks like he's just holding it up to his face <laughs> now that I look at it. Um, they can, uh, be, but cell phones can be a big barrier. Uh, the real problem is what they stand for, uh, the pressures that we are all under to get things done. So we need to demolish barriers to learning, and this needs to happen before, during, and after a training event. Some typical problems, some typical barriers to learning, lack of time. Um, there is one good example of how the manager can come in and make sure the time is carved out for you beforehand, after, uh, during it, of course, that no interruptions, and after it to make sure you have time to apply what you've learned. Scheduling problems. 
a big barrier to learning. So again, you know, making sure people have this on their schedule and moving forward with that. Red tape. If anyone wants to know about red tape, they can call my city office. It's 311, and it just turns into just huge amounts of red tape. But we won't go there. We're thinking of training, <laughs> not trying to get something done uh, in your city. Um, but again, this is uh, something that the red um, that, that the managers can control. Keep the red tape out of the learner's way, and then again, that can be very helpful. Two more are more related to the trainee: a lack of confidence. A lot of people are not sure they can learn, uh, especially if they're getting older and they. You remember how we said it takes longer to learn and all of those sort of things. Um, so a, a good manager can instill confidence in the people that they can do the training that they need. And one last barrier here is lack of motivation. And once again, you know, why am I bothering with this training again? You don't want people going into a training class when they're feeling that lack of motivation. You want to encourage them and get them excited about what it is that they're doing. So in a reality of these four barriers to learning, the manager has a lot to do. So what are some ways we can overcome these barriers? First of all, create an action plan. An action plan is really useful before training because it can set expectations. Um, you know what you're trying to um, implement. It's not a surprise that you, you've actually chosen the correct training because you've written the action plan. Um, during training, it's great to, as you know, as the people who are in training, you know, taking notes and making sure that they know what's going on, and then you can come back afterwards and apply it to your action plan. You can see what's what. Uh, and so after training, it helps to meet and revisit the action plan and add notes from class, anything that you found out that, oh, this is not going to work for us right now, add that in. So creating an action plan is a very powerful way of doing it. You don't want your action plan to look like this. Remember that the palest ink is better than the best memory. So write it down. Part of your action plan needs to plan for the best and prepare for the worst. For example, how do you balance the time needed to apply something new with the time needed to get something done? You know, plan for it. Make sure there's the time is there. Or what if after training a crisis happens and you have to revert to the old way of doing things for a while? How do you get back on track? If you have that plan in place, then you aren't going to be surprised as badly. And having the options in place when everything works as expected, um, then, then you're going to be able to move forward as you need to. Of course, every training should include a way to evaluate it. Uh, if you don't, you may not be able to repeat what worked, for example, or even worse, you will be doomed to repeat what didn't work. Donald Kirkpatrick a professor and the grandfather of adult training and development, created a list of four levels of evaluation that have stood the test of time. Level one is the reaction. How did the participants react to the training? Were they satisfied? Did they find it relevant? Um, most of the time when you go to a training class, you get a survey. That is actually that first level of evaluation. Uh, it might also be the trainer does a survey, too. Um, I have done that in the past, and I learned from it. So that level of reaction is very useful. Level two is the learning. How well did the participants acquire what they were sent to learn? Are they ready to apply that information? Um, level three is the behavior. How well are the participants actually applying what they were sent to learn? Um, are there systems in place to encourage this behavior? So that's another level there. And the last is observation. Your interviews, your um, surveys, tests, things like that, you can, uh, oh, sorry, the, um, those are ways you can, can check the behavior, <laughs> reading the wrong thing. Um, but the results, 
did the training bridge the gap between the expected performance and the actual performance? And also, of course, since money is always an issue, did the amount you spend on the process give you a good return on the investment? So reaction, learning, behavior after the class, and did the results actually meet? Finally, I'd like to encourage you to coach your team. Oops, that's the wrong kind of coach. That's a whole lot better. So not everyone can or be a trainer and know every aspect of a software package, but most people can learn to be a supportive coach. You might be an informal coach while you're working with someone who's struggling with a specific technical problem. Or it might be a more formal relationship, helping the person move ahead in all areas of their work and life, and not just after training. There are a number of good ways coaches can help um, making sure that training is transferred, that the, it's actually being implemented. Um, a great coach asks a lot of questions. So instead of doing the job for someone or just telling them what they need to do, you want to pull the solution out of the person. And asking questions to help them think of alternatives is a way to do this. Another purpose of a coach is to provide accountability. Someone else is looking out for you, but in an encouraging way. And of course, to do this, you need to know exactly for what the person is accountable. So that whole action plan comes into place here as well. And another very helpful coaching method is to set goals together. And notice that I did say set them together because if you're just assigned goals, it is not going to be helpful. People are not going to be excited about them. So if you, or, or it, may, it may not be realistic, which reminds me, you want to set goals and you want to make sure that they are SMART. You may have already heard about SMART goals. Uh, from different sources, um, even my uh, trainer, my, my um, personal trainer is going, we want you to have SMART goals so you'll keep on track and make sure you go to the gym when you're supposed to. Um, SMART goals stand for specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound goals. So when you create a goal, it's, if it has all these components, you know that is actually something that can probably happen. So let me give you a really, really simple ex um, example here. Starting with the XYZ project, we will use the ABC software as outlined in the contract. So it is specific. It is we're doing it for the XYZ project, and we're going to use ABC software. If you go back to the very beginning of this talk, what did I ask you? I asked, what, what do you need training for? And what software do you have? So some things that I, you know, which, what, do you, what do you want to train on? So that sort of specificity is a great thing. It is measurable. Um, at the end of this project, you know, were you able to use the ABC software? So you know it's, it's a measurable goal. Darren? It's also achievable. Um, so starting with the um, XYZ project, we're going to use the ABC software. And if you've had good training, so it's going to be achievable. So that's really important. Your um, training is going to make this achievable in this case. It's relevant, re very relevant. It's outlined in the contract. So if you don't make it, there is a, you know, severe issues with this. So it's a very relevant goal. And it's also time bound. It's going to be starting with this particular project. And as implied, it's going to be finishing with this particular project. So real goals have a bit more depth, as well as many actions and sub-goals that are needed to fulfill the main goal. But if you keep the goals smart on all the levels, you'll know whether or not the goals have been met. So once again, we are getting very close to the end of our hour. Um, let me just read this for you, and we'll go on and, and finish up. What are you going to do now to prepare people to apply what they learn? All's well that ends well. 
Sir Laurence Olivier got an Oscar for his portrayal, portrayal of, Pam, of Hamlet. And we want you and your employees to feel the same way when they've successfully completed training and they've used that new information in significant ways. To bring all the parts of this class together, to make sure it all's well that ends well, remember that adults learn in a cooperative environment. And primarily, it's the manager's job to make sure that the cooperative environment exists but also it's the trainer's job and the trainee's job to have this whole thing work as needed. So just real quickly, let's say how did we do? Uh, did we differentiate? I think we did. We differentiated between an issue that can be solved by technical training and one that cannot. Um, we have identified people that can benefit the most. We've talked about various types of technical training. Uh, we did a quick analysis of learning styles and principles to help you understand how training needs to be applied for adults. And we established ways to help people retain knowledge from a training class. So I thank you so much for uh, listening to me today. I hope that this is going to be helpful in your next training. And I'm just going to hand this now over to Corrine for one last thank you. Thank you, Martha. I just wanted to let everyone know how to reach us. If you're not familiar with Ascent, we are the author of Autodesk Official Training Guides. Plus, Ascent also writes courseware for users of Desktop Ascent and PTC software. So if you go to the website, ascented or ascented.com, you can find all the course outlines, table of contents, and sample chapters for the courseware. You can make purchases there through the ascentestore.com. And if you'd like to reach out to us, uh, for any reason, whether you've got questions about this webcast, any comments or questions about our offerings, you can email us at feedback at ascented.com.